Pepperdine University is very pleased to welcome to each succeeding graduating class an illustrious honorary member. This honor is accorded a person who has made an exceptional contribution to society and who exemplifies both in career and personal life the great principles that guide this university. To such an individual, we grant the university's highest distinction, the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Before we present the Grazie Dio School's Honorary Degree recipient for fall 2014, I invite you to watch this brief video introduction that offers just a glimpse into the remarkable life and entertainment career of this distinguished individual. Who is George Schlatter? Well, besides being my father, he's a radio and television man of the year who has won five Emmys, two Image Awards, a Golden Globe Award, plus awards from the Producers Guild and the TV Academy, as well as having his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He has produced hundreds of hours of television shows and has raised millions of dollars for an endless list of charity affairs and public service events. George Hoover Schlatter Jr. was born, as we now know, as an anecdote for the Great Depression in Birmingham, Alabama. The call of the wild nightlife beckoned, and George entered showbiz as a runner in the mailroom at MCA. But it wasn't long before he became a talent booker and got the Ciro's and Las Vegas Frontier Hotel accounts. In less than a year, George went to NBC's talent department and started booking for the Dinah Shore Show. Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. George's career exploded when his show Laugh-In took over Monday nights and became the conscience of a nation. George always seems to bring out the best in whoever he's working with because he brings his best to the event. And every show that George does is always an event. To escort the candidate and present the Honorary Doctor of Laws degree, it is my pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. John Mooney and President Andrew K. Benton. President Benton, today it is truly my privilege to present the true pioneer in the field of American entertainment and media. George H. Schlatter has enjoyed a career spanning five decades as a successful network television producer, director, and writer, creating and producing hundreds of hours of television series and specials. His magnum opus was the breakthrough television series Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. 
capturing the spirit of the era with its anarchic energy and which has informed popular culture. As we just saw, Mr. Schlatter's work is, a wide, is widely acclaimed within the industry, having received dozens of accolades, including Emmy Awards, Image Awards, and Golden Globe Awards, as well as merits from the Television Critics Association and the Directors and Producers Guilds, and his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Mr. Schlatter has given of his talent and time to numerous charitable causes and projects, including Finding a Cure, Nancy Reagan, A Love Story, for Juvenile Diabetes Research, and the Los Angeles Opera on Stage Gala starring Placido Domingo. He has also produced every Carousel of Hope Ball since 1990, which benefits the Barbara Davis Center for Childhood Diabetes. And indeed, Mr. Schlatter is no stranger to Pepperdine. He attended George Pepperdine College in South Los Angeles, one of four brothers for whom Pepperdine is alma mater. President Benton, it is truly my honor and privilege to present George H. Schlatter for the university's preeminent distinction, the honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Thank you, Provost Mars. Don't take it away now. George H. Slaughter. Thanks for coming here. Well, thank you for inviting me. Because of your innovative and creative contributions to American television and culture, ever making us delight and laugh and always mentoring and informing the entertainers, artists, artists and laugh makers who will follow, because of your great devotion to your family, to your loving wife, Jolene, to your daughters, AJ and Maria, because of the example of exercising your prodigious talents, not just for professional and career excellence, but to advance causes that make life better for children who suffer from diabetes. Truly an example that inspires all of us. Therefore, let it be known by the authority vested in me by the Pepperdine University Board of Regents, I now confer upon you the honorary Doctor of Laws degree with all the rights, all the duties, and all the privileges thereto. Congratulations, Dr. Slaughter. This is exciting. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, I, uh, I, this, 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 may be, this may be the best thing ever happened to me. Uh, I want to thank President Andrew Benton and uh, Provost Rick Maris and John Mooney. And good morning. Um, when I got the invitation to appear here to make a speech in front of a graduation class, I was overwhelmed. I thought at first I'm much too young for this honor. <laughs> but then I looked in the mirror and I said, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. This is one of the definitely one of the best days of my life. I'm thrilled to get this honorary degree so that I can be called Dr. Slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> wow, are you ready for that? I didn't understand the doctor part at first, so I was going to show up with a stethoscope and some rubber gloves. <laughs> But then my wife, Jolene, said, please leave that part out. Right. I want to also thank the faculty, the alumni, the guests, and the magnificent student body. When I went to Pepperdine, the magnificent student body belonged to a cheerleader. She was five foot nine. <laughs> she had red hair, and she was magnificent. Now, I want to explain to you that both my da our daughters, Maria and AJ, have said, don't tell that joke. It is sexist, and it is old-fashioned. So, I won't tell it. <laughs> my, I told, I promise. my wife, Jolene, has been an inspiration and a major influence in our life for the past 57 years. <laughs> Jolene, Jolene said definitely leave out the 57 year part. She was not crazy about having our marriage carbon dated, but anyhow, that's how long it's been. I'm also very proud of both of our daughters, Maria and AJ, and our son-in-law, Kevin Flynn. Uh, they're with us here today, and uh, they are a delight. I was told my speech was supposed to be inspirational, and to be inspirational, full of advice and hope and suggestions 
for what to do, how to live, and whatever you need to do to be a success. I'm not too sure I'm an expert on any of those things. However, my story is unique. I've been able to achieve a great deal with a minimum amount of talent and a lot of luck. So, so I'm just here to make a few suggestions. I believe it's interesting to learn from your mistakes, but don't keep marrying the same one. L luckily, I got it right the fifth, first time 57 years ago. Lucky me. My journey began way back when Pepperdine was on Vermont Avenue in South Central Los Angeles. It's been quite a trip, all the way from the outskirts of Watts, LA, Pepperdine, to the campus in Malibu. The trip is 26.9 miles, and the journey only took me 60 years. <laughs> Anyhow, that's, but I got here, so I made it. I was proud to be uh, celebrated last year at the Pepperdine Communication Department uh, Division uh, at the Still Laughing event at the Saban Theater in Beverly Hills. At that event, Craig Detweiler announced to everybody that uh, uh, they could, in fact, in researching, find no record that I had ever attended any classes. <laughs> but they did find out I'd played football. Evidently, I attended enough classes and played enough football so that I got a scholarship and to be honored here today, if only after 60 short years. <laughs> oh boy, I thought I played better football than that. <laughs> now, it puzzles me to contemplate on what we're giving you in return for this em enormous amount of work and effort and dedication. Let's face it, my generation really screwed things up. We're giving you national debt of over 12, 18 trillion with three of the longest wars in history of the world, the Ebola epidemic, a political system where the Democrats hate the Tea Party, the Republicans hate the liberals, the conservatives don't trust the liberals, and the liberals don't even trust each other. Look what we did. However, I'm convinced you can bridge the gap between conservatives and liberals, the Democrats and the Repu Republicans, and the Tea Party. Well, maybe, maybe not the Tea Party. Today we have great disagreement on issues such as gay marriage, a woman's right to choose, term limits, a budget that is out of control, and I'm supposed to make an address to instill hope and happiness. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> well, don't give up. There's an abundance of both hope and happiness. We have achieved a lot. When I was at Pepperdine, we had not yet gone to the moon, and we were not in outer space. A laptop was often referred to as a secretary. Sorry, Maria. <laughs> and the word, the word secretary doesn't hardly even exist anymore. We've come a long way. Now we have a satellite landed on a comet six million miles away, and it only took 10 years, 10 years. I repeat, it took me 60 years to travel 29 <laughs> miles just to get to Pepperdine. So we've come a long way. So what meaningful advice can I possibly give a group of brilliant graduates? My suggestion is that you have to be ready. Think ahead, take chances, but most of all, be ready. Here's an example. Many, 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 many years ago, CBS hired me to produce the new Judy Garland show. When I met Judy Garland, I was in awe, but I was ready. I said, Miss Garland, I don't care what you may have heard about me. There's no truth to the rumor that I'm difficult. <laughs> she laughed because she really was difficult. <laughs> we laughed, we played, and we worked together and we had a great time, but we were both very difficult. But we were ready. Now then, one of the re leading role models I had was Francis Albert Sinatra. You heard about him? Uh, with, what an adventure he was. And with him, you had to be ready, because he was always ready. He was always early, he was always there, and he never wanted to do a second take. He was always ready. I first met him very early in my career when I was working in the mail room at MCA, Music Corporation of America. My first week at MCA, I was making a mail delivery when Mr. Sinatra arrived at the front door and all of the agents came with him down the hallway to the end and there I was. I was the only one in the building without a black suit on. I had my gray gab gabardine suit, a flowered tie, and oxblood shoes. He, he walked into the room and he had this pile of contracts and he looked around and uh, he, he looked, <laughs> he said, uh, are these okay? And he handed them to me. 
I'm now 19 years old in a light gray suit. So I said, y y yes, sir. So he signed the contract. And he turned around, and as he left, he looked at me, and he says, I have ties older than this guy. <laughs> but that meeting turned into a relationship that lasted up to and including when I was asked to do a eulogy at his, his uh, funeral. Uh, as a result of that relationship, Jolene and I have been involved for 27 years with Barbara Sinatra and her children's center for sexually abused children in uh, Rancho Mirage. Hers was the first treatment center of its kind. <laughs> and now, now those centers, now those centers are all over the country, and we're very, very proud of the part that Jolene has played with that. One of the most exciting adventures I had was when I left MCA, and I went to work for the Frontier Hotel in Vegas. Now, Vegas wasn't then like it is now. Vegas was a different kind of town. Our old boss, Lou Wasserman, who was head of MCA, told me to create an act for Ronald Reagan. I did, and it was terrible. It was awful. So to beef it up, I hired the Marquis family, which were a group of five chimpanzees. They were hysterical. But on the third night, the chimps got loose, ran all over the building, swung in the lights, and rode, rode motorcycles up and down the aisles. They were drinking everybody's booze off the tables. It was, it was unbelievable. Well, uh, but it was really funny. <laughs> Ronald Reagan never forgive me for booking the chimp act. As a matter of fact, the chimps never forgave me either. <laughs> As a result, I became very friendly with Nancy Reagan. Some years later, I received a call asking me to produce an event honoring Nancy Reagan. She wanted to come out in favor of stem cell research, which was highly controversial, and it still is. I agreed to help, and I'm still involved with Dr. William Rader, who has successfully treated, I think it's 2,000 people with various degrees using fetal stem cells. I know it's controversial, <laughs> but one day I think that that may be uh, our answer, and thanks to Nancy Reagan. Uh, now, way back in 1968, I was involved in another type of medicine, medicine of laughing. My show, laugh In went on the air, and it became a huge hit. We were considered to be a liberal show by the conservatives and a conservative show by the liberals. Even way back then, we did some rather adventuresome material. Actually, we put six censors in the home. <laughs> we actually did things about abortion and women's right to choose, and everybody who, and we said everybody who has had an abortion uh, was already born. Like, what the hell is he talking about? But it got on the air, and it did open up discussions that continued until today. We also presented Richard Nixon, who said on the air, sock it to me. Okay, now, a lot of people feel that that helped get Richard Nixon elected and I've had to live with that. <laughs> There's an old saying, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And I did, and often. And in 1968, we were faced with many of the same political, economic problems and unrest that we have today. There was, a, there was a, an endless war in Vietnam, an establishment didn't like the young people, and the young people didn't like anybody. On Laugh-In, we were able to get a lot of things said in a way that brought us together as a country. We, were, we also got a 50 share, which meant that 50 million people were all watching the same show on the same night. Uh, we did create some problems. We, we, uh, we said things like, back then, integration was a big problem, somewhat the same way it is today. Uh, but we said, there's no truth to the rumor that Alabama Governor George Wallace said had he known integration was coming so soon, he would have waited to marry the woman of his choice. <laughs> oh boy, did the, did, did the switchboard ever light up, ever light up with that? 50, well anyhow, 50 years ago, integration was a big problem, and it still is, but that kind of put it out in the open so that people could talk about it. Religious leader Billy Graham, you know Billy Graham? Said, uh, I, uh, he said, he came on the show and he said, uh, uh, said the family who watches Laugh-In together really needs to pray together. <laughs> <laughs> and we became very close friends. He said he got more fan mail from that appearance than from anything he'd done. We, we did a segment called News of the Future. We said, 20 years from now, Dateline the Vatican. <laughs> the Archbishop and his lovely bride the former sister Mary Catherine, 
Both announced this time it's for keeps, if only for the sake of the children. Well, you cannot imagine the amount of phone calls that NBC went nuts. But we, from that one line, we went from communication to excommunication. But, but the network survived it and uh, accepted those ratings that we were getting. We were also very friendly with arts conservative William Buckley on the show. We, we approached him and I wanted him to be there so we could have a political balance. When I asked him to, to do the show, he turned me down saying, not only do I refuse to appear, I resent having been asked. <laughs> okay, anyhow, he came on the show and uh, uh, <laughs> because I offered to fly him to California in a plane with two right wings. That did it. As a result of that, we became very close friends for many, many years. We seldom agreed on a lot, but we exchanged a lot of views. Even back then, we had intense opinions on the right and on the left. The simple little jokes called long overdue discussions. I was always aware, I was always in the middle, and we were having a good time upsetting everybody. In my opinion, laugh is a vital part of our lives. I've always felt that humor is the best antidote, the best solution to our problems the best way to maintain a balance. When people are laughing, they're not throwing punches. Please, please don't start now. <laughs> so I have found humor to be an excellent panacea and at times even a solution. Another show I did was equally proud of and perhaps even greater effect on the public was a series called Real People. We did 140 shows. We were on TV every week for seven seasons. It was the first show that was on the air that saluted real people. It was the first reality television show. However, I'd like to think that the same people, real people, uh, was not responsible for real housewives. <laughs> it can't be right all the time. We did the first series ever done about real people, bringing the attention of the public to unsung heroes. We did the first long overdue tribute to the Navajo Code Talkers, the Tuskegee Airmen, the All-Women Air Force, People like Roy Benavides, who was the last Medal of Honor winner in Vietnam. Our story about Adam Walsh even inspired a series called America's Most Wanted. I was really, really proud of the effect that that show had. And that's uh, America's Most Wanted is still on the air, hosted by Adam Walsh's father, John. On every show, there was at least one or two of these inspirational role models and heroes. Somehow, that was a tough sell. But now it's a regular segment of CNN, and I think I'm as proud of that as anything I ever did. Uh, before I toddle off to take my dirt nap, <laughs> I would like to explain, I, I, I don't want to go serious on you, but I would like to offer one last suggestion. Enjoy your success, and use this wonderful education to help us get out of this mess. This group can be responsible for the American dream and help keep that dream alive. Put something back. Protect our planet. It's the only one we have. Don't let any child in America go hungry. Make sure that while we are spending billions to build new weapon systems, we can also afford to build new schools and cure diseases. Make certain when we send our children to war, we're ready to take care of them when they come home as veterans. Uh, open up those fists and off, make them into hands to shake hands and help others. Those are just a few of the many things we can do to make good use of those diplomas. In closing, I'd like to say good luck, have some laughs, and always try to be ready. As my friend Frank Sinatra said, you only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. <laughs> he, he would also, he would also close, he would also close by saying, if you want to be seen, stand up. If you want to be heard, speak up. And if you want to be invited back, shut up and sit down, which is what I'm going to do now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We okay? Okay, good. Let's thank our speaker again.
Thank you, George. Uh, we are honored to acknowledge your family celebrating this day with you. Uh, and so I want to welcome them. You may have recognized them. They're the ones who, from time to time, have been cringing and wincing over here in the front. Uh, George's wife, Jolene, his daughter, Maria Schlatter, and daughter, A.J. Flynn, with her husband, Kevin. And so we are delighted that you have shared your father and husband with us today. Thank you so much.